Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Money Level Show. If this is your first time here, here we think, act, and prosper. We're focused on changing financial trajectories and building legacies. And this is uh, part two of a series that I'm doing called The Grind to Greatness. And today I have my guy, Irv Ehrenberg. Is that Ehrenberg, right? Did I say that right? You got it. Oh, Ooh. yeah, yes. Woo! I'm not butchering names. So how you doing today, Irv? <laughs> I'm doing great, Bill. Thanks for having me here. This is going to be kind of fun. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So uh, I, for those that don't know, I met Irv um, on the uh, the cruise that we did at the Rural Symposium. And uh, Irv just gives off this energy. Like he's just very genuine, authentic guy. You know, we were talking about um, some of the companies at the symposium and and uh, he was he was giving me some some of the game. And so uh, he mentioned that he managed a hedge fund at some point, which uh, which we'll get to that uh, in his story. Uh, and ultimately, this this show is this series is mostly focused on just like how did people get to where they are today? And so uh, that's what we're going to focus on. So, Irv, uh, let's let's share share a little bit of your background with us. Where, where are you from? And uh, and uh, I know that you were a doctor at some point. Uh, so how did you get on that path to being a neurotologist? Well, I started, I grew up near Chicago. Uh, but after a period, I, I, my family ended up in southwestern Michigan. And I did pretty good in high school. And I went to the University of Michigan undergraduate. And then I got into the medical school uh, in three and a half years. So I started graduate school in anatomy just to kill time and because I didn't want to go home and work in my dad's store in a small town. So I stayed in Ann Arbor <clears throat> and uh, got more credits, got into medical school early, and then I went from undergraduate school in Ann Arbor to medical school in Ann Arbor. So I lived in Ann Arbor for eight years. After I was uh, graduated medical school, I picked to do my surgical rotating internship in Chicago with Dr. Shambo, who was the world's most famous ear surgeon. He wrote the definitive textbook on surgery of the ear. And I thought, wow, I can go spend two months of rotation with the best ear surgeon. That would be pretty exciting. So yeah, I uh, he <laughs> Sorry about the dog. I've got two German shepherds, and they're very protective of anybody coming close to the house. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> no, worries. no worries. So um, anyway, so I got to spend two months with Dr. Shambo, but instead of just seeing this great man, he and I clicked, and we started doing research together. Now, remember, I'm just out of medical school. And within a year, he had me become an associate editor of the AMA Archives of Otolaryngology because he was the chief editor. And we clicked. I mean, we really clicked. So on the topic of how do you get the grind or the, the greatness, what's the title of it? Grind to greatness. Yeah, that was part of my grind. And it worked fantastic. And after I, I uh, did the surgical internship with him, I went to uh, a, a residency in ENT in St. Louis at Barnes Hospital it was a very prestigious program. And I worked really hard there and I got, at that time, the highest award that NIH gives to an individual. So I was just a resident, but I got a, a, what's called an IR1 research grant, which is really hard to get, particularly today it's even harder. And so I was doing my surgical intern or residency and then my ENT residency and I had a big NIH grant, and then I got these awards. So I was on a good, on a good path. And when I finished my residency, <clears throat> I did a two years of fellowship. One year I stayed in St. Louis, and the second year I got a special grant from the Swedish Medical Research Council 
and I got to go to the University of Uppsala in Sweden for a year and work with very famous professors there. And then when I finished my fellowships, I went back and I started as a professor of surgery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for four years. But I didn't like being at the university as much. Um, so I went into private practice in Colorado and Denver. And I was there for years. Um, and I did a lot of really good work. A lot of new surgeries. I mean, I've had 12 international patents, and I met, had my own products, and we actually developed a drug delivery system to the inner ear. Um, and that those that product was bought by a um, um, pharma in Silicon Valley. And that and after, but that in between there, one of the reasons that was a pertinent place is I had that scuba diving accent you mentioned. And because that affected my, I had a, a mild hemiparesis because I had a nitrogen bubble in my brain that didn't work so well and I didn't work so well for a year. And because of that, I had to stop doing surgery, which was my, my life passion. Hey, Herb, before, before we get, before we go further down that, down that, uh, I do want to get to that. Um, you know, I went too far too fast. Yeah. 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 No, no worries. No worries. All right. So, so Irv, you, you, you went through a lot of medical school, you know, um, I mean, you, you've accomplished a lot of things. So I, I do want to go back to, uh, the childhood a little bit. Uh, so you grew up, you know, right outside of Chicago, um, what what was your you know family background like? You mentioned that you didn't want to work at your dad's store. Like, I mean, I, I can I can imagine. <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm sure my son wouldn't want to work with me, you know, at, at any point in time. Uh, but uh, so what what was that like? You know, were you um, you know uh, growing up in uh, right outside of Chicago? Hello, everyone. Sorry for the break in action, but I want to tell you about the link in my description below. This is to the New Orleans Investment Conference. This conference has been around for years and have brought many people out, such as Milton Friedman, Gerald Ford, Alan Greenspan, and Margaret Thatcher. This conference is put on by Brian Lundeen and his team. Brian is the CEO of Gold Newsletter. This year, they're going to have speakers such as Jim Rickards, George Gammon, Peter Schiff, Rick Rule, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Lynn Alden, and many others. Now, I encourage you to click the link in the description below. You can choose to attend the live event, which I will likely be at, as well as the event that is live streamed. You can support the channel by using my link below. So I encourage you to check that out. Now let's get back to the interview. Well, my father had a hardware store and unfortunately he passed away when I was four and a half and then my father passed away when I was seven. And after some issues, whatever, uh, my mother's older sister and her husband adopted me. And then they moved around and we ended up in Southwestern Michigan. And he had a women's clothing store instead of a hardware store. And I worked in that when I was a kid, you know, growing up. But when I got to college, I didn't want to go back in the summer to work in the store. So I took extra courses and classes. So I actually graduated early. Um, which was nice. So, so you were motivated to not work in that store. That's what it sounds like. Well, yeah, retail is not my thing. It still is, and I don't know how people do it. Gotcha, it's gotcha. Great, it's great when you're on a on a roll, but when I've been there and seen when the merchandise isn't moving and they got to move it out and they got to sell it, and this was without the internet back in those days, and it just wasn't my shtick. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that makes sense. We, we all have those experiences. Uh, <laughs> I, rem I remember working with my, uh, my uncles, uh, they, they had a, um, construction business and, you know, like now I, I look back at it like, okay, those would have been some good skills, you know, have some trade skills to have, you know, so that you, you can always provide value to someone or get some work somewhere. Um, but it just was not my thing. Like I was, I just could not get into it. Like, 
you know, I, I didn't like you the culture. Poison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't like the culture. I'm like, man, me and my uncle, we were like almost like getting into fights over projects and stuff. Like, you know, just like it was just like, yeah, like I, I don't think this shape you. It helped yeah. shape you the way you are today. That experience was very pivotal. Mm -hmm. Agreed. That's, agreed. That, that's just part of it, and it's good that you went through that. Mm -hmm. It's part of the process, part of the process in the journey. So uh, just speaking of your journey. So when you finished, um, well, not when you finished, but um, you mentioned that you had a scuba diving accident. Um, so what occurred there? And you mentioned that you weren't able to uh, uh, c finish on, continue on doing surgery after that, right? Well, let me clarify. I was a neurotologist, which means I finished the ENT training. I was board certified. And then I did an additional two years of training to become an ear specialist, just the ear part of ear, nose, and throat, and into the brain behind the ear. So that's what neurotology is. And um, so when I did surgery and I developed some very I think innovative surgeries for the inner ear uh, and the surgical instruments that have my names on it and stuff like that and the device to implant to treat Meniere's disease. And it was pretty avant-garde at the time and pretty much still is in a sense. And you have to understand that this surgery was done with an operating microscope with instruments that you can't see the tips of without magnification. And it was done under the operating microscope with both hands. You needed suction and the tools and whatever. And when I had the scuba diving accent, I had the tremor and everything, and I couldn't do the surgery. So all of a sudden, my whole life's work and surgical career and everything in, in the inner ear surgery came to an end. I could still practice diagnostic medicine and see patients and diagnose their problems. But 80% of my practice before that was surgical. And I still could see the patients. And then when I would see a patient that would be a candidate for the surgery that I used to love doing, I'd have to refer them to my competitors. And that was unpleasant. So I got out of that area fairly quickly. But fortunately, I, as I mentioned, I had these other patents that I had done, and they three of them came to fruition very shortly around the time that I couldn't do surgery. So my two sons are both lawyers and MBAs. And when previous patents that I had, um, we would sell the rights to XYZ company, and we would get a royalty. And that was nice, no complaints. But now I'm basically out of a job. <laughs> so we have to get a little creative. And my kid said, well, dad, look, you just got three patents that is really new and innovative. Why don't we take them ourselves and make them into a company instead of sell them to somebody else? And you don't have anything to do. So I said, okay. So I did this with my two sons. And we took the intellectual property package created by the patents that I own uh, internationally. And um, we took it to an industrial design group. They made their designs. We took the designs to an um, industrial manufacturing group. We manufactured prototypes. We got it in the hands of surgeons. They did the surgeries. We got some preliminary results. We got FDA clearance. We sold it uh, on four or five continents. And then this, we ended up selling the package, the entire company, to a Silicon Valley Pharma. And then my middle son, one of the two lawyers, went with the company as a transition person to the pharma. So we were in Colorado and they were in, in Silicon Valley. And that was 20 some years ago. He was still at that company until a few years ago. And now he is now a CFO and something at some other pharma and doing very well. 
So anyway, my kids, my kids did well, and we got that company up and running. And after I sold the company, I moved to New York uh, with a girlfriend, an art dealer at the time. And then I had some nice money. And the private bankers, this is now 2000, 2001. Really quick, Irv, really quick. I want to I want to chime in on a piece of that. Uh, so you own the patents to uh, some of the work that you were doing in the in the neurotology uh, field. And right. so um, what what's the importance of like, I mean, because that has to deal with like, you know, pretty much intellectual property rights or something of that nature. Correct. Yes. And, and I so, had a uh, very good patent lawyer that was genius and he could take my ideas because a patent is reverse of what you normally think of. It's really difficult thinking. But if you have someone that can take the ideas that you generate and turn it around into patent language and format, it was brilliant. And we had a great relationship that worked for several years. Okay, okay, good, good. So, uh that's that's I mean that's that's a good important piece. I mean cuz intellectual property is something that uh I mean I, we've seen we've seen it happen to like the greats, right? Uh I mean just with people that don't have knowledge on um how to protect their intellectual property and how uh, we've seen uh, manipulation, you know, by <laughs> by big agencies and such. I mean, like we've seen that happen in the music industry. We've seen that happen. Oh, in, yeah. in, it happens in, all over. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important to to be able to protect the intellectual property of whatever you, you generate. And so uh, that's that's a key point I wanted to chime in on. So uh, so you ended up moving to New York after you sold the company. And um, what what happened there? Because uh, I mean, ultimately, you became a fund manager. So, like, you went from <laughs> yeah. So, you, I mean, you went from being you know in a uh, you know growing up in Chicago, moving to uh, Michigan, uh, and then you know ended up going through this whole grind of being a neurotologist, which there's not very many of, I assume, and uh, and then uh, this whole uh, very um, you know, uh, process that that's like very intense and prestigious, you know, you went through that whole process and then now, you know, you having to shift into, uh, you know, your patents and you sold your company. And then now, so now what, what's, what's next for Irv in, in this next, what's, what's the next, what's the next thing to have? Hey everyone, sorry for the break in action, but I have to let you know that I am now an affiliate with Miles Franklin. Miles Franklin has been a bullion dealer for over 30 years and they provide some of the highest quality service to their clients as well as fair pricing on bullion products. So purchasing bullion through Miles Franklin not only stores wealth for yourself, but you're also supporting this channel to continue to provide free educational material for retail investors and those who may not be aware of many financial concepts that I discuss on this channel. So you can get started by sending an email to info at milesfranklin.com or calling 952-929-7006. Be sure to let them know that Daryl Thomas or The Money Level Show sent you and I will receive credit for your service. I thank you all for considering this. Now let's get back to the interview. Uh, the, ne the next career was sort of uh, thrust upon me in a sense. I had several choices, but I have this money because I sold the, the drug delivery company to Silicon Valley. And I'm in New York. And I remember this very vividly because it was really an unusual thing. I was at Fleet Bank uh, at the time. And we were the Fleet Bank uh, private um, group private clients group wanted to manage like, the money. And so I'll never forget this because it was pretty dramatic. I got a 26 year old kid telling me, this is 2001. And he's saying, oh, Dr. Amber, we want to manage your money. And we're benchmarked against the S&P 500 and it's down 23%. And we're only down 17%. So I'm smiling and being really nice. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I sure as hell am not going to pay you 
17% of the money I just made to lose it. I can do that all by myself. What, so, what year was this? 2000, 2001, 2001, probably. Closer. So this was at the, at the, the, when the dot com bubble uh, had just burst. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. yeah, roughly. Yeah. So, I mean, this was the thing. And gold at the time was in the doldrums. It was down to $250 an ounce, roughly, in that range. Man, I wish I, was, man, I, wish I knew about gold then. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's the thing. I knew about gold because when I was a kid, I collected coins and stamps. And the only way you could own gold is in the, after, after Nixon closed the gold window in 70, 71, the only legal way Americans could own gold was as coin collectors or mining stocks. And, you know, he closed the gold in, in 1935 when he, or, uh, that was when FDR well, issued the, the, uh, yeah. the gold confiscation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 An executive order. And once he did that, gold went from $22 an ounce to 35. And that, that was a way to pay off some of the debt they accrued from World War One. That's another whole story. But so anyway, so I'm I'm in this situation. This kid wants to manage my money. I am unemployed, if you will. I'm happy. New life, new friends, a new town. And so I said, when I was a kid. I liked collecting coins and I really paid attention to that and gold and everything. As, as I moved into these through young adulthood, adulthood and adulthood. And it was the only way you could own gold really or participate because there was a black market developing because the price of gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. And, but the real price of gold was much higher. And the only way you could actively participate in it was as a coin collector or in the gold mining stocks, which there weren't very many. But I knew enough to appreciate that gold mining stocks are you own the gold in the ground. And that's a pretty good deal if they're a good company. So I looked into that and I started doing it. I had done it before. Actually, when I was a resident, I would go moonlight. And now we're talking about working in the emergency room for 24 hours or two days or something. And you didn't make a lot of money, but I took the money that I made and I would invest in the South African ADRs. And percentage wise, I did pretty good. Now we're not talking a lot of money, we're talking peanuts. Okay. But percentage wise, I had a pretty good handle on it. So I said to myself then, I said, well, this is kind of cool. If I ever have the time and the money, I can do this. So now all of a sudden, I'm out of work because of the scuba diving accident. I have some money because I sold a drug delivery company. And so I said, I'm not going to let somebody else manage money. It can't be that hard. I'll do it myself. So I took classes and courses in, in uh, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, trading options, stocks, bonds, the whole thing. And initially for the first year, I did a little bit of everything. But I gravitated to the gold because the gold was, everybody was saying gold's terrible, don't do it. And I'm looking at it and I'm seeing, you know, the rise of the gold market. And it really started then. So I started doing it, <clears throat> and after a year or so, I had put together some really good numbers percentage-wise. And so I made some friends in New York that were in the hedge fund business, and I gave them a presentation. And they said, Herb, this is fantastic. There's nobody at the time in the hedge fund world that has a focus on the precious metals and mining sector. They have it in the... In the uh, other areas, you know, but not in, in uh, hedge funds. So mutual funds, you could get something, but it wasn't very good. 
And they said, oh, why don't you just create a hedge fund in the precious metals? Because there are people out there that would love to have 8 10% allocation, but they don't know how to do it. So you could do it for them. So I said, okay, I can do that. So I started it and we created a Nostradamus all gold fund. And we're not talking big fun. And it was really hard to get people to pay attention because I didn't go to Wharton or Harvard Business School. You know, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and so they couldn't accept that reality. But my lectures were good. And I gave them at Opal and some of the meetings. And I got some people, you know, percentage-wise, we did really well. Hey, really quick, Arv. So you mentioned a, a few key points I want to I want to drill in on so uh one of them was uh you know someone came to you uh oh, wait all right cool I think they're good I think they're good it's safe now <laughs> so uh so one one of the points was uh your uh, so someone came to you wanting to manage your money and and you realize like, hey, I can do a better job at this myself, you know. And so uh-huh. you went and got the the education and, and things of that nature, which I, I think a lot of people experience that today. Uh, for me, um, even in my current line of work, I mean, I'm, I'm in a pension fund. Right. But um, I manage my own Roth IRAs. Uh, I don't just I, I'm more of a alpha investor. So I, I look at individual companies and such. And so and a lot of this is just me educating myself. And so like you went through this whole education process of like, hey, I can learn this myself. And I can I can, uh, you know, pretty much uh, be successful at this myself, like because many people think that it's this you have to trust the the big, you know, um, cookie cutter investment funds or, or you know, fund managers. Right. Who who may just go put it in like I mean, today will probably put it in uh, overvalued sectors, you know, like technology and such. And so uh, <laughs> so you knew you saw a beaten up gold sector. And you were and you were like, hey, this is beaten up. You know, I want to look more into this. And, you know, you wanted to go away from the crowd. And so that that sounds like a key point that that I wanted to drill home on. Did I did I get that right? Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to just do everything. And I tried a little bit of everything and I just gravitated back to the goal. Because remember, I had this experience a few years before when I was a resident where I played around with the gold mining sector. And now the little bit that I played around with in the first year or so turned out magnificent. I mean, really good numbers. So I said, and I didn't really see any advantage to taking some kid that was had no essential knowledge and let him manage the money because he was working for a named firm. I said, he's going to lose the money. I can lose the money. And the other thing that's really important in that concept is you have to take control of what you're doing yourself because you can't blame this kid if he he loses the money. You gave it to him to manage. So if you make that mistake and turn it over to someone and they don't do well, it should be your fault, not their fault. That's sort of my thinking. Anyway, so I wanted to manage it myself because if it didn't work, it was it was on me. And if I put it on somebody else, I'd complain, I'd bitch or whatever, but it still wouldn't be that guy's fault as much as it would be my fault for trusting him to do the good job that I should have spent the time and learned how to do myself. And I did. And it worked pretty good. Yeah, that's that's good. That's good. And and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you shared that. And another key point, key piece that that you had um, touched on was that people didn't trust you because you didn't have that financial background. You you were a doctor and such. And um, and that that relates to like uh, today, except now today, um, you know, with how much like uh, the internet and so much information is just spread just just you know vastly you know and it's yeah, so access yeah. accessible like me like I, I don't even have a financial background but like people watch this show 
and they trust me and trust like the the information that I have because I've done my due diligence. And so like, uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting how how that shifted from that point. But you were you were during that time where many people, which probably people today probably still feel that way somewhat, but like not as much. But you were in that in a time where, you know, people were like, hey, you don't even have this background. So why would I trust you with my money? Right. Yeah. Well, I went to the meetings. I listened to the speakers and I read the newsletters and I figured out which ones made sense and which ones I could follow and which ones did well. And I ended up, you know, Rick Rule was a superstar. Brian Lundin was a superstar. Uh, Robert Friedland's a superstar. And if you just pay attention to the guys that are really doing well and follow their ideas and are on board with it and can accept it and it just makes life a lot easier and and you're still in charge okay you, that way you have to feel like you're doing it yourself but you're you're going with the professor the guy that the teacher and that's always been a good thing i mean i didn't do surgery the first day i learned to do surgery from the greats dr shambo the guy i mentioned was the was the world's best, most famous ear surgeon. And I've been extremely lucky in my life that I've always had really great men appear at the right time to help guide me to what I was trying to do. Pure luck, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, so especially if you were, and so when did you like get into like the same room just like Rick and, uh, Robert Friedland and Brian Lundin, like it's, was it like a while ago? Was it during the first, yeah, like yeah. the, the bull market in the early two thousands? Like when, when did yeah. you get into that? Well, circle? In, yeah. In 2000, when I had moved to New York and stuff, I started going to the meetings and stuff that were in New York. And then when there was a meeting in New Orleans, I, I went to the hold up. I went to all the meetings in New Orleans for the last 20 plus years, and I'll go again in the fall. Um, I went to all of Rick Rule's meetings in Vancouver. I love Robert Friedman. I mean, the guy's a, a genius. I mean, he's Midas. He never touches. If it's copper or gold, doesn't make any difference. It's going to be very productive, very lucrative if you follow and do it right and get and position yourself. Positioning is really critical and it's very hard to do in general because a lot of people say, oh, I don't feel comfortable with that. You have to feel comfortable. You have to trust your gut that you got, you're picking the right jockey and horse. You know what I mean? And then you go along for the ride. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really good. Uh, so, um, and so back to kind of just your journey, so you ended up connecting with these guys in, in New York and, and such, and they, they approached you about managing the fund. Some people didn't really um, want to necessarily listen because you didn't have that background. Uh, what Kind of sh share more about uh, what was going on there. Well, I just continued to do what I did, produce good numbers, made presentations, and it just wasn't, I, I guess I'm not a great salesman to be honest. Uh, but I was pretty good at doing what I did. And uh, I mean, over my careers, and the hedge fund was really my third career. My first was a, as a doctor. My second was as a entrepreneur with a uh, medical device, delivery systems, uh, and then the hedge fund. And now I retired from that about 12 years ago. And now I'm writing books and movies. And hopefully that's going to be a home run. Nice, nice. So so how, how big was the the hedge fund that you that you worked with, that you managed uh, some of the uh, products for? It was about 15 million. It was small family office, basically. Mm -hmm. Have nice. any, I didn't get the outreach and the people that created the bigger funds never could really accept my situation, which was okay. I'm here and I'm fine. 
I think I could have done a lot better for a lot of people, but I couldn't bring them in to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned 50 million. Is that post uh, bull run or, or before the bull run took off? Like, cause oh, you, that was by the end of it. By the end of it. Okay. So, so you, you started managing this fund. You, you got to, you, you went, educated yourself on fundamentals, technical analysis and, you know, valuations and such. And um, option trading. Option trading was a big pertinent strategy for me. Mm -hmm. In I option trade. trading, right? And so. I sold a lot of puts. Naked. Okay. okay. Nice. Nice. That's, that's good. So, so you grew the fund from how much to how much? Um. Well, from only a few million to fifteen. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's that's uh that's quite the quite the uh turnaround. So I'm I'm sure people were happy about those results. Um so you mentioned you mentioned that you retired uh about twelve years ago and now you're you're writing books and right. such. Right. And so and this is a part of you being able to uh you know, live, you know, your best life and and uh, do what you love to do. Ultimately, we all want to do what we love to do and such. And you worked hard to get to the point to where you can do what you love to do. So share share more with us about the books. And uh, I know you're re very into Van Gogh uh, and such. <laughs> That's an so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, walk us through uh, the books and, and what, you're, what you're anticipating with uh, this journey with uh, Van Gogh. Well, um, it started a long time ago when I was in high school. The movie Lust for Life came out with Kirk Douglas, won an Academy Award, and it was very well done. And I was very fascinated and attracted to Van Gogh as an artist, his art, his life story. And in high school, um, an interesting thing started happening, or what happened. Uh, uh, one of my best friends in high school, we would hang out at his house and his mother would feed us and all that kind of stuff. And one night <clears throat> she was sitting on a three-legged stool churning ice cream, fresh, you know, homemade ice cream. And all of a sudden she got up from the stool and said, oh my God, oh my God, and the room's spinning. And she got violently sick, fell down, puked. It was pretty scary. We're 17, 18 years old, and this is happening. And my other friend and I are kind of freaking out. And the father comes down. He says, okay, guys, don't worry. She's having a Meniere's disease attack. And we'll put her in bed, and she'll be fine tomorrow. Well, that was my first experience in Meniere's disease. It's a disease of the inner ear that has violent vertigo with nausea, vomiting, fluctuating hearing, ringing in the ears, et cetera. And that was my first experience with that. And I saw it live when I was a teenager. So now I go to Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I'm in, I'm taking an art history class and I gravitate toward Vincent. And so I'm reading some of his letters. And in the letter, one of Vincent's letters, he's talking about his illness, which everybody thought was, as it was diagnosed a hundred years ago, was epilepsy. And Vincent says that in his own handwriting that he had vertige, vertigo, which is a classic hallmark of Meniere's disease. So I'm thinking, oh, Vincent had Meniere's disease because I had this other experience with my friend's mother. So I figured, well, I knew that. And I thought that was an ugly problem and it would be something I would try to fix as a doctor. So then I get to medical school and undergrad graduate from that and I really develop a whole area of expertise in inner ear medicine and surgery and I develop a one-way escape valve to put into the inner ear of patients with Meniere's disease and if you think of Meniere's disease as excess fluid under pressure in the inner ear that when the membranes rupture they get a violent attack of vertigo it's very analogous to glaucoma in the eye. When the pressure in the eye goes up, you lose vision. When the pressure in the inner ear went up, it would rupture, you get vertigo and lose hearing. 
And so that was my focus. And I developed this one-way valve that was patented. We, I did a lot of those surgeries. People came from all over, got really good results, found out how to monitor it with electrocochleography, which is like an EMG, I mean, EKG, I'm sorry, of the inner ear, like an EKG of the heart to guide you with the surgery. And people never really gone down to it. Now, 20, 25 years later, they're starting to say, oh, those weren't such bad results. Maybe what we're doing now doesn't make as much sense. So that's another whole area. But it certainly is interesting for me. So anyway, I get to the point where I'm now on the creative side and innovating new treatments and techniques and surgery and instruments. And this is in the early 1980s. And back then, if you're going to do surgery on a patient, that today would be outpatient surgery, day surgery. You still had to put the patient in the hospital the night before. You had to go by the night before and have them sign the operative consent and explain their risks and whatever. And so I was doing that. And I went into this room and this 24-year-old girl, you could tell she was very nervous and upset. And she was an artist. So I said to her, look, we have a very good chance of getting rid of your Meniere's disease, vertigo, today. And you should be happy about that because your artist colleague, Van Gogh, we couldn't have fixed him. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, Van Gogh had Meniere's disease like you do. He said, no, he didn't. He had epilepsy. And I said, no, he didn't. He had Meniere's. So we went back and forth, and I got her to read the letters, and we ultimately put together a paper that was published as the lead article in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it was published on the 100th anniversary of Van Gogh's death. And, they, and because it was published by JAMA, and because it was JAMA sent out 3,400 press releases back then, it was literally on the front page of every newspaper in the world, on the bottom half, but still front page. And they flew me from uh, Denver to New York, and I was live with Paula Zahn on CBS This Morning and then Charles Osgood on the radio on that day. So for 24 hours, it was great, and then it was gone. <laughs> so um, that was... That was the experience with Vincent, and I, I proved that Vincent, the article was Van Gogh had Meniere's disease. He didn't have suicide. He didn't commit. He didn't have um, epilepsy. But back then when I did that, I was a pretty busy surgeon still, and I never believed that Vincent committed suicide, but I didn't do much with it. So years go by. And now I'm retired. And the movie comes out Loving Vincent, which was spectacular. If you have anybody hasn't seen the movie Loving Vincent, they should. It was an animated movie where this uh, Polish group of artists took, made a black and white movie. And then they hand painted 65,000 frames in Vincent style to make an animation. It was a good movie. It was well done nominated for an Academy Award, but Disney pulled it off with Coco. And, but by comparison, it was... Anyway, that's another story. So anyway, now I walked out of that movie, Loving Vincent, and I said to the person I was with, I have to write Killing Vincent. Loving Vincent, Killing Vincent. Loving Vincent, Killing Vincent. So I wrote Killing Vincent, right here you see that two years and uh got some really good reviews but it was more of a source book i proved forensically that vincent did not commit suicide he was murdered he didn't have the black powder burn around his entry wound and whoever put the hole in his belly murdered him and they had to murder him from farther away than he could have gotten a powder burn. 
because the only bullets that were available in 1890 was black powder bullets. The smokeless powder bullets that we know weren't available for a few years. So that 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 was that story. So I proved that, and then I got two very famous co-authors that were forensic pathologists. One was Vincent DeMaio, who did the Trayvon Martin case, and he wrote the definitive book on gunshot wounds and was considered the world's expert on gunshot wounds. And the other co-author on this article was um, Michael Bodden. And Michael Bodden was a chief medical examiner for the city of New York. He did the OJ case. He was an expert in OJ case and several others. And most recently, he was in on the um, Jeffrey Epstein autopsy. And he clearly said after that that Jeffrey Epstein didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. And because of the neck injuries and broken bones in his neck, it didn't happen from a, a sheet on a bed a few feet of long. He would choke to death, but you wouldn't break the bones in your neck. Anyway, that's another whole story. But anyway, there was wow, a wow, hang on, hang on. These 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 people that you had on the forensics, they've been a, they've been a part of some very high profile. Uh, cases and investigations, and so these weren't just Joe Blows that you brought in to, to uh, you know, assess whether Vincent uh, killed himself or whatnot. These these yeah, were yeah. some high profile. These were top of the line. Wow, they were top line. So it was published in the most prestigious medical forensic journal. Okay, so now anybody that denies the murder of Vincent Van Gogh is a, has to prove some way, not with he said, she, she said, but has to prove somehow that Vincent actually committed suicide. And there is no way to do it. So they have to get off the story that Vincent committed suicide and start dealing with the fact that he was murdered. And then book two, which is this one, the Love and Murder book. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. That is the book. The first book was really like a doctoral thesis. A lot of references, a lot of information. And it really focused on the forensics. Book two is why was Vincent murdered? And Vincent was in love with the doctor's daughter. He was diddling the doctor's daughter, basically. Doctor didn't like it. Didn't want him as part of the family. And he and the son off them. Now, you have to also understand that the doctor was a very erudite dilettante who loved the art of Paris in that time frame in the 1880s, 1890s. He collected Renoirs, Matisse, Manet, Monet, et cetera, et cetera. He was a very wise art collector. And so, book three, which is in development as we speak, takes it the next step because when Vincent was murdered and he was just buried, the father and son came and with a wheelbarrow and took all of the art and stuff that Vincent had in the hotel and in his storage shed, which is like 26 Van Gogh paintings. Now, then Van Gogh is unknown. Today, 26 Van Gogh masterpieces, would be masterpieces, would be incalculable. It would be worth billions. Okay? Took that. And the kicker is, in book three, takes it the next steps. They follow this art for the rest of the 50 years until the art gets donated to the Louvre. And the reason it gets donated to the Louvre, because the father and son, when they took this art, they nobody knew about it. Vincent was an unknown artist at the time. So they take the art and they say, mm. and the father knew that Vincent was good and he couldn't replicate his stuff. So with his art there, they could make copies. They made fakes and forgeries for the next years. Okay, polluted the market and... There was a big trial in Germany in 1930 with Otto Walker, 
an art dealer in, in Berlin who went to jail for selling 30 fake Van, Do Van Goghs. It was a big thing. So the reason they got to the Louvre was Marguerite, Vincent's lover, never got married, was a spinster, got the family, the, the gachet art forgery ring, the father, son, exonerated for their crimes in exchange for this massive art collection which was put on show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City in 1999, when it was the first time it was put together outside of France. And in there, they sort of allude to the fact that some of the art may have been done by Dr. Gachet, and they didn't call it fakes or forgeries. They said uh, they had another name for it, which was... Anyway, that's another thing. But anyway, so that's the story. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty deep. I, I love to go go down that rabbit hole with you uh, again uh, sometime because that's that's, uh, that's a lot to unpack in there. Uh, so, uh, Irv, as we wrap up today, um, where, where can people find your books and what, what, what projects are you working on uh, currently that people should be anticipating? Well... Uh, we have some serious interest now for the movie. Um, taking all this information and putting it together and making a movie called Finally Love that's based on the essence of these three books. And the movie is really put together as a eight-episode miniseries. And the show Bible is finished. The pilot script is finished. The line producer is putting together the budget for this movie, and that should roll out. So we're in the process of trying to find somebody that can appreciate this, because here's the critical thing, Daryl. We have now the ability to brand Vincent, brand Vincent, because we have the literary side. We own the books. We own the rights. We have the movie, the script. And I can take that eight episode miniseries and I can make it into multi seasons. So that means it's a franchise. So if you take the branding and you can make all of Vincent's art is in the public domain. So if I want to make tchotchkes of cups and t shirts with this picture or my book cover on it, we're wide open, but it's all marketing. That's not my forte but I know enough to know that we have control of the intellectual property again for branding Vincent and for making the movies and for making a franchise of the movies. Now, along those lines, the other thing that's really exciting is Cypher Films has come to me with a, an offering from Nat Geo. Now it's just in the talk stages. Nothing is set in stone, but they seem to be interested in making a documentary on the autopsy of Vincent van Gogh. Now, we explored this before and getting permissions in France to do a real gravesite autopsy, which, by the way, both of my co-authors were excited to do and willing to do. That never materialized. So what I've come up with is a CGI <coughs> virtual autopsy exploring all the different rabbit holes that could go down and what would happen if it went this way or that way and that's where that project's at mm -hmm. and uh wh where can people find so you already have two books published uh where can they find those books oh well the key thing is to go to killingvincent.com that is the website and the books in the both books you can look at on there, but we'll keep people abreast of the movies. And there's also an audio book. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the two books, the audio book, and what's happening with the documentary and what's happening with the series. And there's so much information on the website, just about everything you can see on the website as a click. 
And if you go to the drop down page on the website, the first drop down video that's embedded is the sizzle for the movie, and it's a killer. And so go and then if they want, obviously they can order from the website or Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whoever they want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's that's such a fascinating story, and you know, I can I can even see something like that appear on, uh, you know, as a, a series or a movie or or such. You know, uh, that's such a fascinating uh, story of a very prominent artist. You know that that has not um, been done for yet. <laughs> you know that that from what I'm aware of. Yeah, not so, that way. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, thanks, Irv. I'll be sure to link uh, your website in the description below. Love to have you back on to um, go more into this into this uh, intriguing story, and um, and looking forward to um, seeing everything come to fruition because you've been working very hard on this. Well, thanks so much, Daryl. It's been fun, and uh, hopefully your your listeners will enjoy it. And if they have any questions, they can get to me directly on the website as well. All right. Will do. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Irv. Thank you so much. <laughs>